it's not very often you meet someone who is uh, known for breaking not just any record, but for doing something that no other human being has done. Uh, Mr. Baumgartner, it's a pleasure. Thank you for speaking yeah, to us. Thank you very much for having me on your show. I uh, want to start by asking you, I think, what the whole world asked you, I think, to you know, describe for us in a few words that one moment when uh, you finally achieved, I think, what you had been working towards for several years. That means as soon as I landed. Or when you knew you had finally done it, you know, when you, when you achieved the speed. Well, I had a lot of pressure all those, the last five years because if you work on something so difficult and so outstanding and breathtaking, it is really difficult because nobody really trusts you. Nobody believed that you can do it. And many, many times I had some very quiet moments where you sit there all by yourself and you think about, is it really possible? Am I the right person to do this or not? And we had a lot of up and downs. We dropped the ball many times, but we picked it up again. And finally it came to a complete mission, you know. And I was so happy at that moment when I landed, you know. At that moment I still didn't know if I broke the speed of sound or not. But at least I survived because my mom was there, my girlfriend was there, and you do not want to die in front of your mom and your girlfriend. That also was a lot of pressure. And of course, you know the whole world is watching. And I think there's not many people out there who know how it feels if, if you are observed by pretty much half of the world, you know. It's probably the Pope or the President of the United States. <laughs> and I had the same impression. But believe me, when I landed and I was still alive, I really enjoyed that moment because I was working so hard. Just like the whole world, once again, we want to congratulate you for that moment. But uh, I heard you saying something earlier this evening, which was really interesting. And perhaps all of us, you know, we don't think of it that way. When you were standing at that moment, 39,000 meters up above the earth, uh, you said it was a very lonely place. Uh, describe that for us, because, you know, this is one thing to simulate it. It's another thing to even, even practice and work towards it and train for it. But uh, when, it, when the moment finally arrives, what goes through your mind just before you take the plunge? You're absolutely right, because we, we have been practicing a lot, you know. I was in the capsule many, many times, you know, so we practiced everything. And then you take this whole system and you put it up in the air at 39,000 meters, but it's, it's not the same, you know. It totally feels different, because if something happens on the ground, you are surrounded by a lot of people, so they immediately take action and rescue you if something goes wrong. Up there at 39,000 meters, there's nobody there. You're all by yourself. And you have to rely on everything comes down to your skills, um, to your proper training, and to your team on the ground. But they cannot help you. And then when you finally climb outside the capsule, you it's such a peaceful moment because you can see the curve of the earth. You know, if you look up, you can see that the, the, the sky was totally black. And I've never seen black sky before. But at the same moment, you also realize that you're the only person in the world you have you has the privilege to be there. Nobody else has done this before. But then you have to hurry up because as soon as I disconnect from the onboard oxygen, <laughs> I'm only sucking but oxygen yeah. out of my bottles, you know, and those bottles, they only provide 10 minutes of oxygen, so I better hurry up. But I had my, my 10, 15 seconds to inhale that moment. It must have been special, and I, I don't think any, any of us can even imagine it. But um, the other point you make about the training, even physically, on the human body, doing something like this isn't something that you can, you know, anybody can just get up and do. Um, how do you how do you work towards that kind of uh, physical fitness? Well, years ago, I was just doing a lot of workout. You know, I was I had a lot more muscles that I have right now. But then I knew um, while working on Repul Stratos, cardio and endurance is key because you spend a lot of time, you know, traveling, in a lot of meetings a lot of preparation, two and a half hours in the capsule in, in this exhausting pressure suit. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever heard it that before, but after a year I had a lot of problems in the suit. I kind of felt anxious, you know, claustrophobic. And I could only do 40 minutes in that suit, but the final goal was five hours. So I needed help. This was the first time in my whole life, and this was also the most interesting key moment in the project, that I was all the way down on the ground. It felt like I lost the project. Yeah. If I cannot stand in the suit, it's over, you know. And nobody ever thought about that because everybody's like, Felix has done this and that. So nobody ever thought about the fact that the suit could be a potential problem. And that was my, my, my key learning in, in, in working on Rebel Stratos. But then uh, I was talking to Mike Chavez. He is a psychiatrist. He worked together with one of the, the top athletes in the world. And it took us about two weeks to change my mind completely. Two weeks later, I spent five hours in the suit, and at that moment, 
I was back on the track, you know. Before I thought, okay, I have no idea if I can get over, if I can get rid of my demons, but I did. And that was, from my perspective right now, the biggest moment while working on Ripple Stratus. And that's interesting, because like I said, we wouldn't think of it that way, but, you know, all the jumps you've done before this, I know a lot of people probably come to you and say, you know, what makes you want to do that? You know, jump off a tall building or everything that you did in the past, um, you know, there's always something to look at which was higher. What, where do you go from here? <laughs> well, as you said, you know, I'm a very competitive person. That's the reason why, I'm, probably the reason why I'm doing all this. And I like the fact if somebody says, hey, it is possible, you, you can't do it. And then I'm sitting there like, wait a second, let me, let me think about it, you know. And I have no idea wh where that journey goes, but I I'm talking to some other people, you know. Same like on Ripple Stratos, if you look at my background as a base jumper, I have done a lot of things, but at a certain time, at a specific moment, I thought, okay, I have seen it all. I have done a lot of highest building in the mountain, in, in the world, I have done a lot of different caves, I was crossing this channel with a, with a wing strapped to my back, but it was not satisfying anymore. And then I thought, okay, if, if I work on something like, like Ripple Stratos, breaking the speed of sound, I'm a, I'm a total beginner because, because I'm not a scientist, so now I start everything from scratch. I have to find the right people, I have to listen and learn, and hopefully if everything goes the right direction, um, it will be successful. And that was a, a great new challenge, you know, a total different ball game. And that's why it was so unique and so outstanding. And this is why I enjoyed, enjoyed it so much working on Ripple Stratus. And right now, honestly, I don't think I'm, I'm going back to base jumping because it, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. yeah. It's you, never going to be enough, right? I mean, if, next time if I climb on, on top of a high of a high building, you know, and then I escape from the cops, everybody is like, is that Felix Baumgartner? It's, it, it's, the image is not right anymore, you know. It, it was okay and it was necessary on my way up to the top. And in, in order to, to break, to go faster, you know, if you want to go faster, you really have to go much faster. Because if I only go 100 kilometers faster, people have seen the image, people have been there already. So the next big number would be twice as fast as the speed of sound. But going twice as fast as the speed of sound is so difficult because the balloon is the limit. If you want to go three or four kilometers higher, you have to double the size of the balloon. So that means you, can launch, you cannot launch it anymore. So that the next big vehicle to get all the way up to break the speed of sound twice, you know, means you have to do something with a rocket plane. And I definitely think I'm going to leave this for the next generation. All right, it's so a fair enough target because it's not going to be easy getting to where you Thank got you in any case. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.